I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the exalted one, the fully enlightened one. Homage to him, the blessed one, the exalted one, the fully enlightened one. Homage to him, the blessed one, the exalted one, fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You look at that, you say the blessed one, he's blessed because he was able to do this in one lifetime. This is, we used to talk about what these really meant, you know, the exalted one, everyone exalts him because he's a human being and he managed to do this. And from our perspective as practitioners, we should be exalting him because he managed to do it as a human being. He was not a God doing this. He was a human being just like us. And the third one was he's fully enlightened. So he's fully enlightened. Boy, he knows everything, all the knowledge on the on the floor of the um, the floor of the forest. So what he did is his sacrifice within this uh, religious structure is he spent that six and a half years really trying to investigate and suffered a whole lot. I don't know if we've ever done that, actually, that sutta that tells you all the things he tried. Um, we could do it sometimes, not my favorite, but one person came to me once who was a Christian and said, yes, but you know, this is what happened in my religion, but did he really suffer the Buddha? And he really did. He suffered for us, but the message was not that we need to go out and we need to suffer like that too, to do what he did. That's really important. What the message is here, and he didn't do it for us. He did it on the way to figure out how to do, how to open the mind completely. So in our case, we look at uh, the Buddha and we say, he really did suffer for us and try all these things. And then he taught all these different sutras that told his monks specifically what they should not waste time doing my voice is breaking or i'm just speaking deeply tell me no, no, is it better uh, yeah, i don't know i don't it's okay okay yeah. <laughs> okay and um so that's that's what's going on you know he he his suffering was based on an experiment to the deepest level to figure out how all of this works and then he spends 45 years teaching the same subject and what is he teaching? He's teaching us how to repeat the investigation and trying to, he was absolutely magnificent, get it to the simplest form for the most people to understand quickly each part of it, how things work, meaning the Four Noble Truths, the Five Aggregates, the Six Sense Doors, how contact happens, what feeling is, the, just the two feelings are enough for the person to go all the way to Nibbana. The rest of it is discovery as you go along, the multiplications of the different numbers of the feelings, but two of them pleasant or painful is enough for you to actually get the practice to work or pleasant painful and neutral, painful, pleasant, neutral like that. Okay, so let's go into the share screen where I have this document and I kept this as simple as I could for you all. It's just like very, very simple, like only two pages and it's only three, 400 words. Bunty, this is a 
shock, <laughs> you know, when I just took this out and I decided to do it in a simple way so that we can do it together and look at what it means, okay? So the first thing, this is a discussion based on what's called the Adanta Vaga Sutta. It's in the Angutra Nikaya in the Book of One. And um, it's the number four sutta, Adanta Sutta, Adanta Vaga Sutta. And the Vaga means book, so the Adanta book Sutta, you know, break down the topic for examination in this, in this sutta, there's these four pieces. It's looking at the untamed mind versus the tamed mind, number one. Or you would say in a lot of other suttas, the train, untrained mind and the trained mind. You might hear it that way. Uh, but this one said untamed mind versus the tamed mind. Second one is the unguarded mind and the guarded mind. Third one, the unprotected mind and the protected mind. So before we begin practicing TWIM or practicing any meditation, we all come to it in the beginning with untamed minds. And there's a little sutta here in the Anguttara Nikaya it's in the Book of Ones, the fourth part, that is the Adantavaga Sutta, and it's very short. Now, what you are looking at, this is, it tells us that Buddha Gautama declared what kinds of minds were, what kinds of minds were harmful for the untamed mind and what versus the kinds of minds that were beneficial for the, the beneficial mind that would help you have an untamed mind. And the sutta is very short. And the thing about it was I found it for a book I was writing, um, I'm writing right now, and I did a lot of work with it, but I wanted to play with it with you and see if you can understand how I examined this because that's where you really gain a lot of knowledge from it. Uh, the development of mind um, that you're looking at is a mind that is tamed, it's guarded, it's protected, and it's controlled. So when you look at this, you think about it in your mind review, am I actually going to see that I got what I needed from the practice that we're practicing? So when I'm practicing right effort, is that fulfilling this to happen? That's what was interesting to me. So I hear the sutta is, I do not see anything so completely harmful as the untamed mind. Indeed, an untamed mind conduces to great harm. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as the tamed mind. Indeed, a tamed mind conduces to great benefit. And the next one is, I do not see anything so completely harmful as the unguarded mind. Indeed, an unguarded mind conduces to great harm. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as the guarded mind. Indeed, a guarded mind can do I do not see anything as the unprotected mind. Indeed, I do not see anything so completely beneficial as a protected mind. Indeed, a protected mind conduces to great benefit. So it's all coming about, it's either harmful or it's beneficial, but the pieces that are involved is the tamed or untamed, the guarded, unguarded, protected or unprotected. And this last one is, I do not see anything so completely harmful as the uncontrolled mind. Indeed, an uncontrolled mind conduces to great harm. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as the controlled mind. Indeed, a controlled mind conduces to great benefit. So we looked at the summary of it and we see, I do not see anything so completely harmful as the untamed, unguarded, unprotected, 
uncontrolled mind and indeed an untamed, unguarded, unprotected, uncontrolled mind conduces to great harm. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as the tamed, guarded, protected, controlled mind. So indeed a tamed, guarded, protected, controlled mind conduces to great benefit. If we go back now and we look at the framework of this back here in the beginning, I, this might not have been on your paper and if you want it, you can write me and I can send it to you again or I can send another version to you. Because I, I looked and said, the question is the untamed mind versus the tamed mind. So if, okay, let's go to the first, so first one. So when we're looking at this, the untamed mind knows nothing about how anything works. And this is a big secret. If we're teaching you without teaching you how and exactly how the person starts and what happens as it goes down the track from the point of contact and the contact as condition feeling arises with feeling as condition craving arises with craving as condition clinging arises with clinging as condition habitual tendency arises and the habitual tendency we're looking at is the habitual tendency to want to react. And this is hooked in, it's hooked in to Atta. And Atta is everything in my life is personal. It's all about me. Everything I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, it's all about me, it's mine. It's actually even myself, it's who I am is my life is what that does when I see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You see what's happening? So it, it's totally moving into the capsule of this uh, existence in society today where we're in, going for the top for as much acquisition as we can, for as much for me as possible and the alarm system so nobody else can get in to see any of it. And we're, we're going so far out from what we need to what we want. And it gets very, very self-centered. So we're feeding that if we're caught in a personal view of everything that's happening. See? So then he, he says, basically, an un, uh, the untamed mind is troubled. And what happens is when people are speaking to us, this is the picture we can paint. When somebody's speaking to us, suddenly they're not speaking with us, they're speaking at us. And we are threatened immediately. And we're thinking constantly what we can say next. We're not even hearing what the other person is saying because they're attacking us and we need to be prepared to defend myself. So this is a situation we deal with in the world. It's a kind of tragedy for human beings. But once we explain to the person how this is all happening and we get into explaining what the craving actually is and notice we go back to the Four Noble Truths in order to explain this. We go back to the Four Noble Truths and we set them up, suffering, cause, cessation, and the path to that cessation. And we take a look at it when we're going through this. So let's go back on here a second. Let, let's go to, um, what did I do? How do I do this? Let me see. I think I have the other to do side. this you a different side. You do whatever you want to do. You don't okay, we go to hand. the stop screen. Stop uh, share screen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So here, if we look, we start out and we have um, the the four noble truths. And you know, this is where it really fascinates me because you have you first have the suffering. You have the suffering. 
And then he looks at the cause. Then he looks at the cessation. And then he looks at the way to cessation. So first of all, you have this as a guidance system for investigating the whole thing. One, two, three, four. And he's teaching you the guidance system. And so if you're going to do what he did, you have to find a practice that's really utilizing this as you're practicing. Okay. Then the next thing uh, that happens with this um, is, uh, you know, he taught you about he taught you very clearly about the five aggregates. And we had this, the, the structure of the being, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, consciousness. He explains that to you and he teaches you this part, okay? And then of course, because he's teaching you about the being, he's saying, this is the being. And I went, one time I was a Sunday school teacher the first time in Sri Lanka and they didn't have any books. They said, we said, what are we gonna do then? He said, just teach them what you know. That was dangerous for me. But I had, I had uh, nine to 12 year olds and this is what I taught them. I taught them this first and this is how we're gonna investigate this way. And then I have to teach you who you are first before I can talk to you about anything about suffering. I have to tell you what you are, how you have to look at yourself to understand how suffering is actually going to happen, okay? And then the next thing was I had to tell you there were six sense doors and the kids, you know, they know this right since six sense bases. So there's eyes, this is in the body, an extension of this, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And these five are experiencing the external, external world. And then you have mind. And we have this way of, of examining an internal world, internal world to put everything together. And the next thing we do when Bonte's teaching in the first time, when you go to a retreat, it's always the same way. The first night he's giving instructions and he's giving you this information. This is what he's basically, do you're gonna hear it. If you write this down, you can sit there and check it off in the first talk he gives at a retreat. So here's the being and he has the five aggregates and the sense doors are structurally there. And then he explains with one example, how the a working sense door plus the, the object, the eye object, or in this case, that is forms. Actually, we can do that. Let's be polite and do it the right way. Okay. So the eye sees forms. So the eye plus, right, the forms plus the eye consciousness. Oh, and now this is a discovery. This pool of consciousness is activated for the human being through these doors. Okay. So here they are. Here are the doors, right? That's how it works. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. It's operating through there, but also there's one for the mind too. Okay. Works the same way. Mind meets a thought non consciousness, mind contact. And then you sit there and you fall into a lot of little circles that are buzzing around. So what does it look like in your brain? That's what I said to Bonte one time. I said, so what is actually going on in your brain is like there's, you have a thought say, mind meets a thought and mind consciousness. And the three of them make mind contact. And as soon as contact comes up, then feeling comes and it's a sad feeling. So you have a you have a painful feeling. So that's this one, okay? But the brain is actually working like this, see? Like that. So if you had no knowledge of how this works, you could get caught 
all day long <laughs> with one going into the other, going into the other, going into the other. This is the wheel of samsara. And one day, one student came in and he said, that's why I, I said, why don't we draw? I did it with the kids in Sunday school, draw the wheel of samsara and why we're stuck on it with the suffering. And he's, and he's the one that did this. He was about 12 years old and he went like this. And he went, he made his circle like this, see? And it wasn't just 12 links, it was going, he, I said, well, is that the dependent origination? He says, no, that's the whole wheel of samsara. That's how your brain is working. And this energy is all there. And then the excess energy is here. And when you die, it shoots out into the universal consciousness out there somewhere. And somebody's born, they get a little bit of consciousness. When they come in, they get some of the habits you had or something in another lifetime is what the karma part is about. That's what they, they talk about that. I want the eraser, give me the eraser there. Okay. So I thought that was a pretty good picture personally. <laughs> I thought it was great. So you have the I, the forms I consciousness and that equals contact. Okay. Let's do it this way. That equals contact. And when contact is condition, feeling. And then with feeling, with condition, craving. And craving is where actually, I always tell you that this one is where it starts red, don't I? Because this is red. And these guys are red for a reason. Craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction and that's for the untrained mind the untamed mind or untrained mind they're always going to react they're the ones that jump in and they're the ones that you have to fight with to get a point across with and they're the ones that are the trouble so troubled sometimes at school even on college level even at work even in corporations it's all over the place and so these are the ones that have the birth of reaction. I'm stressing this because once you're realizing enough knowledge, something happens here where um, the what's left, and I don't know if I ever showed you this, but what exactly is left of the Arahat? Somebody's bound to ask that every time I teach, somebody's bound to say, well, but what about the Arahat? Okay, so the Arahat has contact and he has feeling, and this was the Buddha too. He does have feeling come up and he has painful or pleasant feeling come up. He does, okay? But he doesn't have a painful mental feeling. He has painful physical feeling, but not painful mental feeling, okay? So you have contact, you have feeling. Um, he doesn't have craving. The craving's gone, the clinging's gone, the, um, the habitual tendency to react, that's all gone. So what does he have? He has contact, he has feeling. And then what happens is he has the birth of action. You see? So we're absolutely sure, sure we're certain of it, that when the Buddha became an Arahat, he didn't disappear. <laughs> and someone said that to me once, and I said, how did he disappear? He taught for 45 years. He couldn't have disappeared. And <laughs> so, so he was there, but he had the birth of action. When I say he had painful feeling, well, you heard it in Bhante's talk fairly recently. He did the talk where the Buddha started a talk, but his back was hurting. And so he taught, he said to, um, to uh, Sariputta, I think, please finish the talk. And he did, he needed to lie down. He said, I need to lie down. If you don't understand all of this, you think that he just got up and went in his cootie and went to, to bed and let somebody give a talk. But that's not what was happening in this particular story. He was just laying down and listening to the talk. Sariputta gave the talk. You know, it was Sariputta or Ananda, I'm not sure. Okay, so you have the birth of action. And then what happens here afterwards, you have um, the aging of the aging and the death of this event. Because remember, when we're talking about dependent origination, we're talking about how to watch 
our minds go through every little piece of this. And so you have to remember that when um, the event starts and then it happens and then it's over, that's all that this is about, the aging and death of the event. But there isn't going to be any sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Um, the pain of the body can be there sometimes, but physical and anatomical pain, okay? But the uh, mental pain isn't there. That suffering is all gone. It's just gone because he has an imperturbable mind. It's undisturbable, okay? So now here, the contact, the feeling, the craving, and this, this we make this one, whoops, this, I can't be green. Let's see, we have to make sure we make it red, right? So this guy, this one is red too, okay, the craving. So we say this is the red zone. <laughs> this is the one that is so troublesome for the untamed mind, okay? And then the only thing I would say, uh, the other thing he always gives you in the first lesson, if I wanna complete telling you that, he takes you through um, not the all of dependent origination, he shows you how it goes from the, he shows you how it goes from the sense door down here through contact and feeling, okay? And craving like that. And he stops, he stops pretty much there. And then he doesn't really talk about mental proliferation in first talks in suttas, but in, in retreats rather, they will come up in the talk about dependent origination, usually mental proliferation will happen. When you say mental proliferation, that's this one, that's, that's clinging. Mental proliferation is a description of, of clinging. So it's another way to say clinging. And in the Majima Nikaya number 18, the Madhu Pindika Sutta, okay, the Honeyball Sutta, that's, they talk about this, they don't talk about clinging but they do talk about craving and mental proliferation. And then you get, you can understand the rest of it's there. So you won't hear all of this in, in that first lesson. You'll hear this example that goes this far. And then right here, you're not going to hear it, this part right here. Okay. But that's what he makes clear to you that this is how it builds up and how the tension happens. So that's the person who is the untamed mind. And that person suffers a lot in life. So then let's go back to the, um, go back to uh, the, um, to the, to the piece now. Okay, here, whoops, I did all the way. I didn't mean to do that. To go back to this, uh, this one. Come on, you can give you permission. <laughs> did I leave it somewhere else? Is that what you're saying? Oh, buddy. <laughs> is the and then it is the habitual tendency and the birth of reaction and the looping that happens that keeps happening um, circle after circle after circle if you don't know how it works you have no defense and then you say, let's look at the other one. I do not see anything completely beneficial as a tamed mind. Nothing is as beneficial as a tamed mind. The tamed mind can do such a great benefit. What is the tamed mind? It's somebody who has a clear understanding of at least as, what I, as much as I showed you there, okay? And they have seen how the tension builds up and they know something that first person, the untamed mind does not know craving. They do not know craving. It's not enough to say craving is I want it um, and attachment. You have to, or I like it, I want it attachment. You have to tell me what it feels like. Otherwise you can't identify it. This goes back to the bicycle story of taking a bike ride and having a flat tire. But if you don't know how to change your tire before you go on an 80 mile bike ride with a bunch of people that know how to change their tires, they just keep riding and you're stuck there and you can't change the tire. Well, we're trying to show you how you can change the mind by changing the perspective of how you're going to see things. So it's really, the, the, the human being is so much more powerful than we ever thought. 
that we were. And when we uh, show things sometimes to people when I was working in mental health and I worked a lot with depressive uh, disorders as a support liaison person between attorneys and judges and law situations for depressive disorders. And they're so completely lost. I can still remember their faces and that they, because they don't understand anything that's happening and they think everything is happening to them. Their whole perspective in the untamed mind or untrained mind it, it is just because they, they don't know how anything's working. They're lost. And so the next part here, I, um, the tamed mind is the person who understands this information, has this knowledge. Let's go to the next verse. I do not see anything so completely harmful as the unguarded mind. Indeed, an unguarded mind conduces to great harm. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as a guarded mind. Indeed, a guarded mind conduces a great to great benefit. How do we guard our minds? What is the one thing we talk to you all the time about that protects you from the hindrances? Can anybody tell me? What is it? I'll give you a hint, there's five of them. <laughs> what is it that protects you? It's uh, the not, not breaking the precepts. That's right, not breaking the precepts. Key. And this is trying to get people to believe you when you tell them not to break the precepts. If you don't break them, then these other hindrances, they will not come up. So in the other scheme of the map that I showed you, we teach you the five hindrances in the first time you meet Bhante. And we teach you the five precepts and we show you the umbrella effect of the precepts protecting you from the attack of these five hindrances from above. If you keep your umbrella open and you keep your precepts, the hindrances don't come to bother you. But if you break a precept, you have to sometimes stop and think. And Bonte's fond of telling the story of the woman who couldn't sit because she knew she broke a precept and he said you broke a precept she got very angry she went home and then the next night she came back and said yes yes I figured it out I did break a precept I was in the kitchen and I started to kill the ants she was killing the ants on the counter and um, she didn't she didn't realize that um, at first she just didn't remember it's not something you really um, you really recall that, you know, remember she just swept them all and put them in the hot water and flushed them down the thing. Oh my gosh, she's sure she's going to go to hell and she's going to end up being flushed down in the hot water because of this. And now remember, it was on purpose. So she's not in that much trouble. Don't kill or harm any living beings on purpose. Um, because you can be walking up a path and all of a sudden you're walking through an ant's nest and you didn't even realize it's not your fault. Going up the steps to the garage to get into the car. But if you, you will get... Um, decide you're gonna wipe out a colony, that's when you're in trouble, okay? You can reroute them and play with them with the kids to reroute them, but don't take them away from their house. And they're a very organized society, don't hurt the ants. Don't hurt the spiders, for the most part, you can catch the spider and put him outside. Don't hurt the cockroach, he wants to live in the dirt. This is the fact of the life of the cockroach, I'm gonna tell you the truth. So. You can, one way to get them to leave the, leave the kitchen, this is great. You slice cucumbers, cucumbers and leave them on the counter. And then next, you come out early in the morning. You won't put on your counter at all. They hate it. And the other one was um, 
lemon rinds on the floor at the bottom of the counter usually stop the ants from wanting to go up there. Yeah, these uh, we we put a thing on our website once and asked all the kids in about seven countries to tell us all the different ways we could not kill things in the house and they kept inventing things, you know. They even have a little thing where you can get a bug catcher. <laughs> it's wonderful. Okay, so they have all that. Well, what about, uh, sister, what about uh, mosquitoes? Yeah, mosquitoes are a real issue. We're not supposed to ever smack a mosquito. And my remedy for mosquitoes is to go to sleep with the AC at about 22 and then set it up for half an hour and get yourself under the sheet and you're fine. Nobody's going to bite you because they can't move. I finally figured it out. They can't move at about 23. They can't move. But they really can't move. If you put it at 22 and you keep the fan just going low, they can't bite you. They can't, they can't move. So that's one solution. But um, I think the most upsetting thing happens when somebody comes to the center, sets up a tent and puts a bug, a bug buzzer, you know, next to his tent that's battery operated and everybody freaks out. Don't do that. It's really bad. That's kind of like setting up the gas chamber. It's really horrible, you know, because they all fly right into it. And it's really sad. These, these bugs, you need to spend some time with bugs is all I can tell you, because to appreciate the bugs, you have to spend time with them to understand. Spiders, you have to, to gain respect of the spiders. I know there's that one movie Disney did about the spider, but I'm talking about when you're in the forest, you have to really take a look at what does it take for a spider that is like this big, just like that, only that big, okay, like the size of a dime, okay, less than that. And he can jump all the way across a walking path from one tree to another. And he can spin a web that is the exact size of a DVD. You know, a DVD is like this round, okay. It's exactly round. And the precision of spiders is absolutely fascinating. But we don't really need to destroy them most of the time. When you're getting into hot countries, you have to be careful. You understand there's rules. Um, if it's red, watch with dread. Same lesson about the, uh, you don't touch the spiders with red spots or the ants with red spots or any of that world with red spots because they got a venom that's gonna make you sick. It'll really knock you out. There's one ant that is a solitary ant. It's called a velvet ant. I'm sure that you have it here. We had it in um, Missouri. It's a, it's a solitary ant. It doesn't have a nest. You can follow it for hours. I used to follow them and try to find where the nest was. And someone finally told me it is a, um, it is a solitary insect. I don't get that whole thing, but it is a solitary one. And so it has no home, but if it bites you, it was considered a cow killer. It could kill a calf. That's how bad that is. a young calf that was just born, if it was near where one of these was and it, and it bumped it, it could bite it. But we're big, you know, human beings are pretty big in the bug world. We're terif they're terrified of us. And so when you consider seeing a small snake and getting really upset when it's this long, and maybe this big round, you, there's no reason to be getting upset. You don't go play with it, okay? But the, the thing about snakes is simply to learn their, about their houses and to learn how they eat. When, what time do they eat? When do they come out? When do they sleep? Once you know that, you can go anywhere you want in the, in the forest, anywhere you want. There's just certain rules. You never sit down on a tree that fell down. <laughs> don't ever do that because you don't know what's underneath the tree underneath it by the ground could only be this high and somebody could be sleeping under there you have to understand where snakes will sleep and they only come out to eat when did what time do the snakes come out in missouri it's very funny missouri at 3 35 p.m from uh, lesterville because all these hills, you know, and as soon as the shadows fall on the ground, then the mice come out 
from their nests into the shadows because they come out for the evening and the night. And so as soon as the shadow, the, the light goes down and the shadow falls, the mouse comes out and the rat comes out, pack rats, and then the, the snakes are out there trying to get them and the frogs are going out at night and they go out, they start croaking. As soon as dark hits, they start croaking a certain kind of croaking. And that's when, that's when they want to eat them. It's, everything's so organized in that world. It's amazing. Anyway, back here, let's go back here a minute. You know, um, go back here to the, um, uh oh, what happened now? <laughs> Bunty, what happened now? <laughs> uh, I want to get to the next verse, but it it abandoned me. I wonder what happened. I'm not sure. Uh, I think uh, this uh, sharing got stopped. This sharing okay, is stopped. Okay, I can fix it. I know where it is. Whoops, that's not it. Oops, wait a minute. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> um, where did I get that? <laughs> I know I, the easy way is to go into Word and take the last document, right? Okay, there we go, I got it. Okay, now, but you can't see it yet, right? I have to go back to Zoom. And then I have to go back to you guys and now, why did I get it in there? Hmm. Oh my. I love technology, by the way, they're going to be a whole new technology. Now that you finally learned how your computer work, get ready, because in 2021, my understanding is there's a Genesis technology that's going to come out and it's going to be different. It's going to rock the whole world. They, these guys just love to change everything. So I can't keep doing things the same way. Okay. Um, can you see this now or not? No, I don't think so. There, I got it, okay. So the second verse, we go down here. This one is about unguarded minds and guarded minds. Now think about your practice. Think about your practice. An unguarded mind, when hindrances come up, this is how this sutta is related to our concentration on sutta, on hindrance management. An unguarded mind doesn't understand how the hindrances work. And most of people have decided that's really irritating and it won't go away. And if I push harder, I can make it go away. And over the years, we have developed modern writings which say that we should, you ready? Destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suppress it, subdue it, make it stop because it really is irritating us. So that's what we grab a hold of that and we struggle a whole lot. But a guarded mind is someone who has been uh, of great benefit to have a guarded mind because when things bother you, we have what? Right effort. We have TWIM or six R's, whatever you want to call it. And I'm renaming it because I'm going to call it the never mind game. So never mind. We're just going to say never mind, let go relax our head, smile, and come back, and we know a secret. We know several secrets, and this is where the knowledge comes in. We know that a hindrance is valuable because it shows us where our craving and clinging is, number one. We know that a, hin a hindrance always arises in the same exact way. We understand how the suffering works. How the, dis, how the process works for the dislike, right? So we used our dependent origination to understand that. And we also know because of Sister Kama and the Samyutta Nikaya and other things, we know that hindrances need food, nutriment. And we learned from Bonte and from me, you have learned that hindrances have nutriment. So one time, I had to teach a class in uh, Malaysia of all soldiers. And I know quite a bit about the military, having my family's always been involved in it, many different branches. And I know a lot about strategy and stuff. And I also read Sun Tzu's Art of War. So I decided I was going to present a class 
based on Sun Tzu's art of war and teach these people meditation. So part of the deal with Sun Tzu's art of war was he advocated winning the war without destroying the land that you were fighting against. He didn't want you to kill everybody. And obviously this happened after Genghis Khan. <laughs> okay, he wasn't real good at this. But, but, <laughs> but when we look at Sun Tzu, when he's coming around, he's saying, this is how you do it. The best way that you can defeat the enemy is to destroy the supply line. That's what you do. You destroy the supply line. And then that army doesn't have enough food and they have to go home. And that's it. And you didn't destroy anything and you're going to win the area because you don't have to fight a war. You're going to maintain the mineral deposits and everything that's valuable and the people are going to have to come under your rule, but you don't have to be mean to them. If you're good to them, they're going to be prosperous and produce for you. If you're mean to them and destroy everything, you won't have enough food, not just them. You won't have enough food when you go in there for the first couple of years. You won't either. So he was very, very wise. Now turn it around and apply it to your practice because you found out that hindrances have nutriment. What is the nutriment? Are we in control of the nutriment? Yes, we are in control of the nutriment. So if personal attention is the food for the hindrance, it stands to reason Sun Tzu was right. The hindrance will just fade away and not come back if you're not going to pay attention to it. I don't know, this is a simple rule. And when in 22, uh, you know, Aligadupa Masuta, I can't understand sometimes, but it's really ingrained in us the other way. We have to fight, fight, fight and win our position and be the one to control and steer the boat. You know, we have to steer the boat. We can't just relax and sail with the wind. We have to control it, you see. We can sail, but not, you know, you choose a destination and use the wind properly. But we don't have to struggle to do that if you understand how a sailboat works. You don't have to struggle with a hindrance anymore. Anybody struggling with a hindrance, come on, wake up, <laughs> you know, because if you take away the food, the hindrance is going to fade away, it will fade out. And it might come back a few times, but it, it gets weaker and weaker if you understand the operation of the hindrance. So once again, knowledge prevails. Knowledge wins in this situation because the hindrances need food and we take away the personal attention. How far should we take it away? Just in one or two instances, or should we take it as a law I think that it stands very strongly as a law in meditation that the hindrances live off our personal attention. And if we remove the personal attention and we decide in our, we have the power to decide that's volition, that's choice, that's very Buddhist. We're not just sitting. And our choice is not to leave our object of meditation. And so, our object of meditation, this is the object of meditation. And this object of meditation, I'm not going to leave it. No matter what comes up, I'm not gonna leave it. In our case, we believe in fun, <laughs> we believe in smiles. And so we choose loving kindness for our object of meditation. Don't stop smiling. Did you ever notice that when you are pulled away to something, or actually remember I told you, you're not pulled away. It's your decision that you leave. <laughs> okay, that, so we can't blame the hindrance. We can't get angry at them. I know men that got really angry, they call it the dark night of the soul. <laughs> you know, and they're stuck in the dark night of the soul for months. Oh, they're fighting the hindrances for six or seven months. Why are you fighting? You can't win. The more you, you pay attention, the more they come back and the stronger they get and the longer they last. This is a sad story. 
So if we know that, can we accept the fact that we should not pay any attention to anything that arises during the meditation session? If we just took for granted no thought that arises has any information in it for us that will help us for our meditation. So we make it into a law. That's what I did with the meditation laws. I they, students all agreed, there were 17 of them, they all agreed that's definitely one of the laws. That it has food and that it has no information for you. So leave them alone and they'll go home wagging their tails behind them. Yeah, this is from the nursery rhyme, you see. Leave them alone and they'll go home crying their eyes. That's what they'll do. They won't come back because you won't feed them. So we have this system in uh, TWIM. Let's look at that. Do we guard our mind every single time that you practice the steps of right effort? You are first, you are purifying the mind. And second, you are retraining the mind. This is what your practice is doing constantly. And it's doing it in the exact way that the most recent research has come out about changing a habit. Did you know up until a couple of years ago, I think it is, they did, many people just still don't believe this, that anyone can change as an adult. They just can't change. They're cooked. They're there. That's it. They're stuck. I was so excited when I saw this new research and I'm there, see, see, I told you, we knew this, you know. You can change. This is the beauty of this whole thing. And we know it in our practice. We know we are changing as we go along. That's what we know for sure, okay? So when you something arises and the moment that our mindfulness gets weak and our interest falls down and our curiosity moves over to that, that's, we just did that. You notice that's not the hindrance. The hindrance is just sitting here, poor little hindrance, you know. The moment you do that and you see you're doing it, you just let go of that and you relax your head and your mind is in your head. We're saying that, we're gonna say that it lives there, okay? They didn't find out it's not my belly button, so it must be there. <laughs> okay, so your mind is here. And your heart plays into your mind. You feel these things. You sense these things. So I think heart-mind is a good thing. I think it's a good angle. But you let go. You relax, smile, and come back. And it's okay for you to giggle and say, caught me again. Darn, got caught me again. <laughs> and then you just smile into it. And when you're laughing about being caught, what you're laughing about is look at that. It did it the same way again, the same way again, the same way again. It's like on a, on a loop going around on the computer. Okay. So that's about that. And the guarded mind or protected mind, we're protecting ourselves every single time that we practice, we are protecting ourselves. Because we're purifying, but we're retraining, retraining, retraining. What happens to a person who does TWIM for one or two months and they actually do take it into life and they use it in the office, in the car, when they're driving and they're shopping in the supermarket on a Friday night and everybody's really crowded, you know, when they can't get a locker at the gym and they're angry about missing the ticket for the train, everything, TWIM, 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 6R, 6R, 6R. What happens to that person in about two months? They call me up on the phone. Ring, okay, and I pick up the phone and there they are. Oh, you'll never guess what happened. What happened? Well, usually this happens and it really gets me upset and all of a sudden nothing happened. Do you see what just happened? That person's mind went, ah, oh, relax, smile, come back automatically. And the person didn't even ask it. To do that, didn't ask the mind, and mind said, okay, finally, I, let, I understand what you're trying to teach me. I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the mind starts doing it. This is what this is about. Training the mind to go on automatic. Training the mind to lean in the, in the direction 
And that's how we're guarding mind. Next one is the protecting the mind. We're protecting it. Are we protecting it? If you're not protecting it, you are attacked left and right. And it's very harmful for the un uh, trained mind or the untamed mind is unprotected. And, and once again, knowledge wins out, knowledge wins out. So in Western philosophy, they always used to say the truth will set you free. And in Buddhism, we say knowledge. And then you might starting to change its habitual inclination. And what you're teaching your mind to do is to follow where the person, the mind, where you want to lean to go. You don't need to boss it around. You don't need to make it die. I had someone write me this week about, but how do I make this happen again? It happened on Monday and I want it to happen again. You don't make anything happen. This is uh, an agreement. This uh, experiment in meditation is an agreement when you're practicing to step back and allow mind to do what it would do naturally if you weren't plaguing it, trying to boss it around, what would it do? And this person found out that it could go in the first jhana, the second jhana, and the third jhana very comfortably, and then said he didn't realize he was in the already had been in the first jhana. We don't talk to you about first jhana, second jhana, third jhana. We start talking to you about the fourth jhana because we've figured out how you go through um, the first, the second, and the third. And when the loving kindness starts to change into compassion, moves up to your head and turns softer and softer, that's when we start to talk to you more closely in the interviews, okay? Then you need to know where you are. I said, I want to make the first jhana happen. Can you do that? Nope, can't make it happen. Now, this person wants to really, would be real interested in, in getting into um, determinations and practicing determinations, but don't try, listen carefully about this. Do not try to work with your mind in a way where like you're decided as a baby that you're gonna run before you crawled and walked. You need to crawl. There's a lot of value in the development of your mind by crawling. It helps your mathematics for one thing, but you have to crawl and you have to walk to develop if you were to try to run too soon, you could hurt your bones and bend your legs and cause weaker muscles. This is all really true medically. So why would you want to start trying to do determinations before you had already gone, before you went at least once all the way through to you develop with the flow with the river and the tides and whatever it takes naturally develop so you don't want to jump in there and start bossing it around but having said that once you get to the eighth jhana and fall over once now you know the path and once you know the path and you're very comfortable with it, or you're in the deeper states and your equanimity is very clearly secure, and you understand what the stillness and security is in your established equanimity, then you say, I'm kind of bored, I'm stale, what should I do? And I might say to you, why don't you start working? See what your mind will do though. Don't boss it around. See what your mind will do if we try to help you start doing some mastery in determinations. See, your mind has obeyed you with one spiritual friend. Your mind has obeyed you again with 11 other people. Your mind has obeyed you again when you leaned and said, please go in this direction, that direction. See, your mind is cooperate. Your mind is communicating. Your mind is communicating with you sounds strange, but that's what's happening. It's a form of communication, trust and, commu and communication that you're developing. So as you are developing this, okay, then 
you're going to ask it in a certain way. We'll show you how to ask it. If you ask it the wrong way, guess what? If you say this sentence, it will work. Okay, you can sit there until you're blue in the face and you're not going to end the first shot. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. It's real. Okay. So it's a communication game, but he's perfectly willing to do it. If you asked him the right way, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm cheating. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you have to set it up the right way. So you're not demanding it. Selfishly self-centered, auto oriented and demanding it versus you'd like to end up there if possible sort of thing. There's another way to say it and it usually works 90% of the time. So that's the way we teach you about that, but don't do it prematurely. Cause I'll tell you what, what happened was he tried to boss the mind around and then the, wouldn't cooperate with him with the directions all of a sudden. I said, well, that's what happens. You can't boss it around right now. It thinks that you have said to your mind, you're free to develop and become alive as much as you possibly can. You've given it permission and now you're gonna step back and start bossing it. Yeah, but I want you to do this and I want you to do that. Don't do that. Allow it to open up and bloom like I told you, each person has four seeds in the side of them. Allow the seeds to be cultivated and come up and bloom the meta and it turns into the to the karuna coming up and then it starts to bloom and it finishes and sets off the modito see this is a process trust it okay so we're learning all the time to protect our mind we're learning to protect it with the with understanding the relationship of the hindrances and the precepts by using the Eightfold Path, by understanding the Eightfold Path that all those elements are a form of protection. If you understand those pieces, if you understand the view you're changing is from, is from um, I, me, my mind to just open to impersonally watching a process happening in the universe. Some gurus are dear, they'll tell you the whole thing, everything you see, everything. <gasps> it's all just process. <laughs> That's what they'll tell you. And you know what? They're exactly right. But I'd like to tell you also how to go further. Okay, so the last one is an uncontrolled mind versus a controlled mind. Now, this is rather funny, okay? because I told the story of the man who went to the Buddha and said, I want to learn to do meditation. And the Buddha said, why do you want to learn the meditation? Just out of curiosity. And the man said, because I've lost control and I want to regain control of my mind. And the Buddha went, mm. <laughs> and then he said, okay, uh, we'll teach you here, uh, but, you need to understand you're not going to like what we say. And he said, what are you going to say? In order to get control of your mind, you need to understand how to let go of all control, all attempted control of your mind in order to see clearly how everything actually works. And this is like the darndest thing, because if you have somebody who struggled all their life and they didn't have the help of their mom and dad or something like that in the relationship. And they had to struggle to survive on just to be existing and just to make it to adulthood. They had to be control of everything. And now they've had a breakdown and now they wanna come back and build themselves again. And you're sitting there saying, well, see the answer is easy. You just don't try to control so much. And they go, ah, I can't, what am I supposed to do with that? Test it, test everything. I don't want you to believe anything I just said on this whole talk, how's that? I want you to be able to sit in a way where you are actually gonna be able to see exactly how everything works that I am telling you about. We're only trying to be describers. We're sort of immature painters as guides. When I hear somebody say it one way, another way, and we try to say, could you please all say it the same way? That's not going to happen. <laughs> we don't have any control over it. So you have to keep 
Whatever you choose to say, this is my advice. I finally figured out my advice to one teacher was, um, I'm not saying to you, you have to say it exactly the way I'm saying it. It's not that way at all. But what I'm saying is that you have to be very careful when you start teaching, whatever you choose to say, that it is working systematically with everybody the same way, because that is the truth of this teaching. If you go in and you look in uh, 72 in section 18 and read what Vacha was told by the Buddha, you will see very clearly that he put his foot down about this, the Buddha. And he said, if you are training with someone else or you have taken in another method or you're mixing methods, he's touched on all of this stuff, this is not going to work and you won't be able to do it. He just flat out tells Vacha the facts. And so this is also a discussion that has been going around uh, with many of us, this is a discussion that has been, um, you know, a discussion that has gone off and on with many of us in the TWIM community about the forgiveness meditation. Well, I want to do my breathing meditation in the morning and my forgiveness in the afternoon and this way and that way. Well, initially we said, no, now it's getting sort of funny and I'm there. I'm not going to be getting funny because I realize that when you are learning for forgiveness, in order to train the mind for that, you have to only do forgiveness. And then when it knows how to do forgiveness, after you have done the program through one time, then if you want to do that, it's fine. Because, because look at the end of the program, the way we used to tell you, now you're finished, you can go back and do the mental. What do I do with this forgiveness? Well, this is a new tool. So you just put it in your toolbox and keep it. And if something happens in your life, we told you, you could pull it out and you could use it. Yes, you can do that. Absolutely, you can do that. But when you're learning it, come on. If you, if I was training, go back and training with bikes for a minute. If I left my um, 10 speed and I went to a 15 speed bike, the coach wouldn't allow me to ride a 10 speed at all anymore. And if I left the 15 speed bike to go to the 21 speed bike, he wouldn't let me touch the other one. I would have to get rid of it and buy the other bike and only do that. This is the way it worked. So once I give you this, don't go back to the other one is the principle. This is the same thing. You're teaching the brain and it's the same thing. So why is it so difficult for me to change my habit? Because you refuse to go like that. You want to go like this. <laughs> and you go to the, you know, the psychologist every week and you say, it's not working. It's not working. Well, I told you to go like that. And now you're saying it's not working. Come on, figure it out. That's the fact. Okay. The next screen here um, at the bottom, the question was controlling mind. Okay. Controlled mind and the uncontrolled mind and the controlled mind. Now, what do we really mean? This isn't one of these dicey things about Buddhism. When we say, controlled mind. What do we mean? And we mean get the knowledge that you need to understand how everything is working and work within the framework. When you investigate what's happening, use the framework of the Four Noble Truths to investigate what's happening. This is happening. What is the cause of this? What am I doing wrong? What am I, where am I going off the instructions? And then what is the cessation of it? Well, when I stayed on the instructions and I did this, I, I, I it worked. And why is that over there moving so fast? And I'm not because watch them. I'll tell you, you sit in a session and watch them. They never stop smiling. Never. Okay. But when you, when you sit down, I can take a movie of you and you go, okay. And then at the end of your session, where are you? It's like Laurel and Hardy, you know, when you pull down, you pull your mind down. 
when you smile, you lift your mind up. When you lift your mind up, it gets lighter. When it gets lighter, it gets more spacious. When it has more space, it has time to say, I'm not going to react anymore. I'm going to respond. That's how it works. This is how it really works. So you need to have fun with this more than anything. Remember that this control and uncontrolled mind has to do with knowledge also. So it's, see, with each section of this, when we read the end of it, I do not see anything so completely harmful as an untamed, unguarded, unprotected, uncontrolled mind. Indeed, an untamed, unguarded, unprotected, uncontrolled mind conduces to great harm, exhaustion, no sleep. I don't want to eat or I eat too much or whatever keeps happening. Terrible. I do not see anything so completely beneficial as the tamed, guarded, protected, controlled mind. The tamed, guarded, protected, and controlled mind conduces to great benefit. You know, I had a, um, okay, I had, um, I was asked to go to a meeting once when I was in Aurangabad. It was real interesting. And I was asked to go to this meeting with a judge and a doctor and a writer and an artist, a painter. And it was fascinating. And the judge is the one who started to come at me and say, well, if this is such a big deal, what you're teaching, show us how it is. Okay, sit back and you have five minutes to do it. <laughs> oh dear, you know, five minutes to do it, she said, okay. And I started to just sit there for a minute, try to put it in the front lobe of my brain in five minutes <laughs> and how I was gonna do this with him. Brilliant man, brilliant man, okay. And so I explained it to him. And then he said, so really what I understand about all this is all I really need to do. And he had heard this someplace. He had read it in some book is get in a boat, go to an island and just be alone in a cave, have people drop off food and stay there until I get it. And I open up and like this, I just took my left. Well, that's okay as long as you have the instructions before you go to the island you see that's the trick to all of this the idea of going off by yourself and doing the deeper practice to examine things if you don't know about the four noble truths and you go to the island it's a big waste of time if you don't know dependent origination so that you can use it, the seven links properly to see how your mind is operating, you're gonna bang your head against a rock when you get over there, you're gonna be so disappointed. If you don't understand the principles and the knowledge about the hindrances and the truth about how they operate, you are going to try to beat them down and clench your mouth and bite your tongue to fight with them and you're all gonna be alone in a cave and it's cold, <laughs> okay? And then he started saying, I see your point. Yeah, so I'm saying that you can get enough framework probably to go there for a week's time anyway <laughs> to the island. If you would just go through one retreat for 10 days and get the basics and take notes and ask questions and try to make signs. Lately, I've been telling the, the class down in Australia, you guys have to make signs. And they said, make signs for what? Make signs for everything. I had signs on the ceiling when I was sleeping for seven years in this trailer. The signs were on the ceiling and they were in the bathroom on the inside of the door. And they were by the door before I went outside and they were over the stove if I was making tea. And I was reading, reading this all the time and drumming it in my head. How did he do his investigation? How did he figure out the cause? How did he figure out the cessation? How did he use the Eightfold Path? And big one, what was right effort? That sign sat there for a month. That's an amazing thing, right effort. And the majority of the Buddhist world is saying it means work hard. 
persevere, keep going, don't stop, all this stuff, you know. Nobody is talking about the four steps of right effort. Four little steps. Recognize when an unwholesome mind state's in your mind. Release the unwholesome mind state and relax your head. Bring up a smile, which is a wholesome mind state, and come back to whatever you were doing and keep going with more wholesome states. If it's a scale in your head, make it all wholesome, loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness, joy, balance the mind, go out and do it again. Somebody yells at you, forgive them. Why should I forgive them? Says Q is my questioner. Why should I forgive them? The big question is not why you should forgive them. The question you should be answering if you want the world to change is why not forgive them? Right now we're in stuck in a period of time where nobody seems to forgive anybody and they push forward in crazy directions. Now, right now, India is learning that if you're all living in the same house, you better forgive or you won't survive. <laughs> so you forgive a little bit more and you begin to laugh. You have to have a sense of humor. If you don't have a sense of humor, where's this thing I had yesterday? I said the, the, the five piece or four pieces, let's see, five pieces. I mean, this is sort of a side line anyway five pieces to a successful marriage that'll last 55 to 75 years. You ready? This is, this is the solution. Number one, you have to be the person's best friend. You have to trust them to be able to discuss anything and not tell lies to each other. You have to be able to have this. Otherwise the person or you are gonna go out and find it somewhere else. It should be there in the marriage. Number two is respect. Respect is for, the the tragedy of modern marriage is sometimes uh, I saw a way both of you but they have two beautiful candles on the side so when you come in and you start the service they light one for you and one for him and then when you're married they light this one together and the tragedy is that that's a beautiful service by the way the tragedy in modern times is then they blew out the other two candles and they only had this one and what did the girls and the guys do with this they, they looked at the tragedy of the idea of thinking now the two have become one for life and there's only one person here, but there's still two brains. There's two professions in the house. There's two people desiring to have some private time somewhere for spiritual development. And there's two people that are gonna be fathers and mothers of children with this sort of thing going on, you see. So this blowing out of the two single candles is a tragedy. So and what I'm saying is the respecting the person's personal development for each one and the, de the desire to have some private time somewhere where you're supporting each other to have some private time so that you can develop your personal spiritual walk. It's very important. Third one is communication and communication is a blotch. Uh, most marriages, they don't communicate, <laughs> you know, and it's a big tragedy. So how do you start to break this down? Okay, 10 minutes a day, each person takes five minutes in each direction and they ask several little questions. They're just four tiny little questions. What is going well for you right now? And they talk to you about that. What is tough for you right now? Second question, what are you gonna do about that? You babble to the person on the other end of the phone, what you're gonna to do to fix it. And the fourth one is, how can I help you with this? And it, we're talking about transportation or getting your lunch or making sure that I iron your clothes for you when you can't do it yourself or you know, sharing whatever needs to be done. You know, 
and they just a chance to share that with the other person so that when they come home, you know, something's going on and they never talk about it. It just builds up, builds up, builds up the pressure until the person is about to die from a heart attack and, and blood pressure and everything else. Okay. Because they can't talk to anyone and the society doesn't want them to talk to anyone outside the marriage. So this really pays off if you you work at being friends. The fourth one was appreciative joy. And appreciative joy is interesting because in a lot of marriages, one person has appreciative joy. It means they're so happy when you're happy. It, they're just so happy, okay? More than they ever are for themselves. The other person in the marriage doesn't know what to do with this or how to do it. A lot of times it's guys, but sometimes it's the women who never learned it. But the big thing about appreciative joy is you can practice it and you can learn to do it. You can learn to do it. So you really look at what it means to the person that you love when they really succeed at something and really celebrate that for them and your joy that comes up in you is that they succeeded and vice versa. It has to be the vice versa. You have to develop the vice versa. <laughs> don't just say a vice versa. You got to have it going on both sides. And if they don't know how, then you sit down and the communication and try to. And the last one, Bonte said, we couldn't leave this last one off because the people that we interviewed these people, my goodness, these people had been married for 70, some of them 75 years or 65 years, and they went through the Great Depression and they didn't get a divorce. These are the people we got to interview. And so he said, you forgot one thing. And I said, what? Don't you remember the man? And he talked about what happened when they came to get the cows and take the cows away. I said, oh yeah, he was laughing the whole time. He didn't know what to do. So he started laughing. He wasn't going to go and cry. He just thought he was so upset about everything. He needed to just start laughing. It's a sense of humor. These people had a remarkable sense of humor. I mean, these people came and they took the feed for the animals away because they couldn't pay for it. And then they turned the you know, electric off and they were using candles and gas for cooking. And the next thing they know they're taking the animals away. And then they come back and they take the equipment away and they take the seed away. And then they come back from the bank and they take the house away. And you don't have any place to put all this stuff in a house that your family has owned for a hundred years. So where are you gonna go? They got in a truck and they rode around, rode around the United States and you, the government gave them some campgrounds and they stopped in one of the campgrounds at the little cabins for maybe a, a month. They had 30 days or two weeks time to be there. And then they had to get back in the truck and go again and keep going. And this is thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are doing this. Most families, they got divorces or the men left and worked in the city and the women got together on one farm and they grew all the food and kept all the children in one place and kept them uh, educated and working on the farm. But everything collapsed, you see? And that's when you really have to pull together. This is what I like about India. People say, why are you staying in India? <laughs> because it's much better for me here uh, mentally. Uh, there's a lot of things that are much better for me here than in the United States. It's so <laughs> like that. So this is this is the United States is like <laughs> like that. And India is like, okay, we're here. Look at the tree. <laughs> this is the tree. <laughs> it's just people take time here to celebrate. And I, I live in a community that's not the wealthiest community in the world here, you know, where I am. But one thing I noticed around me at one night, I couldn't sleep because there was a celebration. And then the next night there was a celebration. The next night there was a celebration. And I thought to myself, how can you be angry about these celebrations? Because the thing is, they keep celebrating all the time. There's something to celebrate about. And even though things are restricted and there's a lot less money and a lot fewer things that they have that they belong and it's easy pretty easy because basically I don't own anything except when I set up this office in a bedroom I'm all in one spot it's the most I have had and I don't know how long it's <laughs> having stuff this here but not having the pressure of possessions is 
absolutely incredible giving when I gave everything away to get ordained. And I did it in a fashion the American Indians do it because I thought, well, if the Indians are really neat because if they change their names, the American Indian, they have a naming ceremony and they give everything away that Jane owned and now they become Judy and then they start again. And they might do it two times or three times during their lives. So that's an excuse to give everything away. And then if you were to divorce uh, divorces in the, in the villages for the natives in, in, in the Native Americans, they were wonderful. The, the man went on a hunting trip and to get the deer and bring it back for, for the food. And the woman had decided when he's gone, she's had enough and he's, she's not gonna, she doesn't want him anymore. So she tells him like this, I am not going to be your wife and turns around and stamps her foot twice with her back to her husband and says, you are not coming in again. It's all on the ground right here, wrapped up in the blanket. And she goes inside. That's it. That's the full thing. No court, no fight, no possessions, nothing, no problem. That's the divorce, you know, and it's an amazing thing. I knew one couple that pulled it off that way. And then later they went and got a actually went and got a paper at the courthouse, but they decided to do that first for their separation. There was no hard feelings. It was just like, it's time for this person or that person. But the honor of the marriage, the, the honor of the morality, the honor that still exists in India is a very precious thing, a very precious thing. And the children are so much more balanced here than they are in the industrialized nations, in my opinion, they're much more balanced. The, the, the connection with the mothers and uh, the connections with that part is all, is all more balanced. I'm not saying that there's no problems, no domestic violence, nothing is ever wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the core structure and uh, the most interesting thing I've mentioned it a couple times right now is that in counseling people every week, there's three or four people that it's a lockdown issue. <laughs> and it's a lot of times more often than the women, it is a lockdown issue with the men. And the issue, it could be the woman expressing the stress that I have to do everything in the house now because before this happened, I had four kids and a husband and, um, I had a maid and a cook. And when COVID came, the maid and the cook left and went to the village. <laughs> and now there's me, but the men don't want to do anything. <laughs> and they have to bend like the sapling tree. Do you understand? And the sapling tree blows with the wind. Strong trees, hardwood trees, when they're young, they blow and they bend, you see, and come back, you see? And the other thing they need to concentrate on is a Nietzsche. Because no matter what you're asked to do, haul the wood or wash the floor, do the dishes one time a week, or maybe something, laundry, I don't know. It's got a beginning, it's got a middle, it's got an end, so start laughing. <laughs> Start laughing and go through it and get it done. It's not forever. You see, it's not, it's not going to destroy anything. Think of your, uh, the woman of the house as being a home executive and the man can be the CEO. It's okay. <laughs> okay. They can be a domestic engineer or they can be a home executive, whichever doesn't disturb you, but you can stay the CEO, <laughs> okay? But these women, uh, any woman in, in the world, it's not just in India, but any woman, I don't think that men really understand, you know, that they're basically doing nutrition and cooking and cleaning and laundry and they're also managing some cases finances. And in other cases, the whole household 
maintenance, everything is being, and then transportation for the kids and, and then the purchasing for clothing and the purchasing for bedding, the purchasing for everything. So when you have all that going on, I think they can at least be the domestic engineer and you can be, you know, the CEO, <laughs> okay? And then everybody pulls together and you'll all get through. I know it, <laughs> it's true. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up for questions. Please ask questions, okay. Do you get what this was about? Yes. Sister Kema, yep. in this, uh, so in this sutta, I uh, personally, I, 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 what is the difference between uh, an untamed mind and an uncontrolled mind? And, uh, you know, they seem the same. Um, and the unprotected mind and the uh, unguarded mind. They, they seem the same, isn't it? I mean, is Buddha using the same words? I lost you. He, okay, uh, when he says tame, untamed, and tamed. No, okay. when he says when he says untamed and uncontrolled, or he says untamed and uncontrolled. What is the difference? Okay, untamed. All right, listen, untamed and tamed is like unskilled mind or a, a skilled mind, same thing, okay? Uncontrolled mind and controlled mind is a person who is fighting hindrances or fighting is letting it run all over, okay? It's like an untrained mind is, okay? But they get themselves in position. They never lack those minds. Like there is no, there is no setting it up. There's more like fighting with it, trying to control it. See, but but when there's two different um, divisions. When I talk about my mind, the person out across the street has an untrained mind. It's untamed, and they use this. This untamed and tamed thing comes from Angulimala. It comes from that story. You know that story? Okay. So Angulimala was totally out of control, untamed at all, wild person, totally in the forest. And, and he was originally, you know, he originally was from a very decent family and he was a very smart young man and he was going to school. And the boys in his class got jealous of him because he became teacher's pet. This is what happened. And the teacher was an older teacher who had married a younger woman. And the woman was interested in mathematics and so was he. So they used to sit together by invitation of her husband at the house and talk at great length about the mathematics. And um, then the boy, he didn't have any problem with this, but the boys made up a story that um, he was doing something with his wife and he really, this was a slander against uh, him to divide the whole setup. And they crashed him. And the teacher was so uncontrolled that he told, he screamed at him, I'm not throwing you out as a teacher. I'm telling you this. You go away. And if you murder 1,000 people and have 1,000 fingers to prove it, I'll let you come back to the school. And that's when he threw him out of the school. That was what happened, basically, the short version. And so he went out and he was, he had killed 999 uh, people. And he was an uncontrolled person. And he was untamed. And he was smart. His mind was totally uncontrolled. So the mind is comes under control with knowledge of how things work you calm down and go into equanimity the taming and untamed is more like behavior external behavior see those i would say that's probably the biggest difference here and what happened is nine, nine, nine fingers and he wore these dead fingers on his neck in a necklace and he determined he knew his mother was going to walk down the path that night in the forest in mid determination. This is a really big deal. If I kill her, that's it. That's the last one. And then I can go back. 
maybe I can go back. I don't even know if he was thinking about trying to go back at that point. He was like on the most wanted list for the um, the FJI, that's the federal, the, the federal Jungle Investigation Service, okay? Everybody wanted him, okay? And so what happened was the Buddha looked, you know, the Buddha did this thing. Every morning he sat for two hours in compassion. And when he sat very deeply in compassion, he could use his divine eye to see where someone was that was really ready to become an Arahat. He did this a lot. And then he would go to where they were in his version of an airplane was to jump in the earth and come up in the other place. And when he got there, he would try to teach the person, you know, this potter story, the man who was in the potter shed, remember that story, okay? And so what he did was he went earlier before she got there to the path and stood there in front of him and said, Angulimala. And Angulimala said, well, it's not my mother, but it would be really terrific if I could kill the Buddha. You know, So he starts chasing him. And the Buddha does this thing where he's floating, no matter how fast Angulimala runs toward him, he's that much further away, the same distance, no matter how hard he ran to catch him, he couldn't catch him. You see, it's a great story. And then Angulimala screams at the Buddha, um, stop, what was it? Stop chasing me. I think he stopped chasing you. Stop, oh, he says, stop. He just says, stop. He screams at the Buddha, stop. And the Buddha stops and he says to him, I have already stopped Angulimala. You are the one that needs to stop. Now that's not the end of the story. See, this is the problem. You don't end the story there, okay? The question is stop what? Stop what? What did the Buddha say he stopped? Can you guess what the Buddha said that he stopped? Can anybody guess? He stopped craving, completely stopped craving, didn't he? He was an arahat, it was completely turned off and all the emotion, everything, all the anguish, all the suffering was gone. He was completely in control and in a controlled mind and, and he had stopped. Angulima didn't understand and the Buddha said again, I have stopped, it's you that needs to stop. And then he started weeping and the Buddha said, come, and he came with him. And he went to a temple where he taught Angulimala and he ordained him and he started practicing meditation. Well, then the king shows up and the king is gonna arrest him and knows he's at the temple. And so he comes in, he says, I'm glad you're here master, but be, be careful, be safe because the bandit and Gulimala is around and he's very, very, very dangerous. And he sort of went, I don't know how to talk of this story, but he, you mean him? He's sitting there as a monk in deep meditation, just practicing and smiling, you know. And he says, oh, that, that can't be him. He couldn't be like that. And then they decide to leave him alone and leave him with the Buddha. So he becomes an arahat. When he becomes an arahat, his life is not easy. This is the interesting part about the story. In cloth, mud, and sticks in him, and so he goes to the Buddha and says, "You know, I'm clear. My mind is completely, you know, controlled and clear and tame. But what do I do with this?" And he said, "This." He said, this is just, this is something that will be with you until you, you're finished, you know, but here's what you can do. And then he teaches him, I don't know if I have it here, I'll look it up for you and I'll send it to you. He, he teaches him a parita and the parita is the Angulimala Sutra. And he says, whenever a woman is pregnant, Angulimala went to the village where the woman was about to have the baby and would start chanting this particular sutta over and again, it's very short, keep doing it and doing it. And the woman would have an easy birth, no matter what the situation was, they would have an easy birth. 
And so this is what he made his practice. And then gradually these women, I guess, and you know, the women calmed down and people calmed down, but he had a tough time till he died in the end. But that's the story of Angoli Mall. And you can't tell that story and, and finish the story by saying the Buddha said, stop. And that's all we say, because the question has to be answered. What did the Buddha stop? You need to stop Anguli Baba. And then the Buddha had a little talk with him and took him away and taught him. That's the story. It's a great story. I love it. It's very nice. I didn't know this whole part. I knew only the part where Anguli Mala goes to the Buddha and how Buddha, you know, how he gets completely changed by looking at the Buddha. It was not this. Very lovely story. Thank you. See, the Buddha prevented him from killing his mother because if he had committed the crime against his mother, he would have been uh, not have been able to become Arahat. He wanted to break it and stop that. So he's the Buddha's right there, right on top. Anybody else have a question? Sister, there's one more. Yep. Um, how? Uh, what is the difference between unguarded and protected? Because in English, they seem the same. Okay, let's see. Wait a minute. I just happen to have my favorite book here. <laughs> let's see what happens. This is the universe. This is a little tiny book. So let's just see what happens. Yeah, to guard in, in terms of, yeah, this is one of the reasons why, okay, by the way, you cannot teach Buddhism with an English dictionary. She says, as she opens up an English dictionary. <laughs> No, but um, let's see if I can find let me QR here, guard. If you are a guard for somebody else, you are protecting the person, okay? So a guard, you, when you're guarding the door, guarding and unguarding, once again, you're guarding your... Um, you are guarding, you are guarding or you are, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I think what we said basically was you are guarding yourself against wrong behavior. This is like with the eightfold path, you're using it, you are guarding yourself, okay? And um, you're guarding the view that you decide to live with and the images in your mind and how your communication works and uh, the movement of your mind's attention, you're guarding that, okay? And your livelihood, your life, your lifestyle, and then your, uh, You're guarding yourself when you practice right effort, aren't you? You're guarding yourself then too, because you're guarding yourself. You're protecting yourself. They're sort of interwoven, but protection. If we look up guard here, we have stand guard, protect, and protect is right there. And if we go to protection, this is what I always like to trip it up. You know, if I go to protection is guard there. <laughs> You know, I love these books when it says it one place and it doesn't say it at the other place. Let's see what it says where it says protect. Um, to keep safe, to save, to safeguard, to shield, preserve and defend, protecting your mind from Okay, in my sense, my, my mind goes right to protecting myself from the wrong music, from the wrong lyrics, from the wrong types of things I see or hear or smell or taste. That's protection. But when we're talking guarding the mind, um, in the process, I was trying to do it, interpreting it from the standpoint of your practice and go back to your practice, say, how do I guard myself? Day-to-day -day life, you protect yourself out in the world in the um, conventional reality because your interests and your practice 
are attempting to investigate the higher reality, okay, which is how everything works in the human being, okay. And so these two, it's true, the words go back and forth. I mean, but you have to, I was taking it and using one in terms of the practice and one in terms of protecting yourself from life, protecting yourself. Bonte tells a story one time about going to a party and everybody there was drinking and carousing, telling dirty jokes and all kinds of bad stuff. And he wasn't comfortable, but then he noticed there was about three or four other people that were kind of quiet. And what happened was he was doing a lot of loving kindness at the time he was practicing is before he was a monk. So he sat down near where they were and the four of them started talking about interesting things outside of what anybody else would be talking about. It could have been ecology, it could have been the water, it could have been anything in California. But everybody moved out of the room to the other room and he stayed in that room with these two or three people who, whose energy were completely different. And people say, well, there's nothing to this energy stuff. And I'm there, I'm sorry, but there is a great deal to this energy stuff. And um, the people can feel the energy, the loving kindness and the Karuna energy can be felt, especially if you go to hospitals, especially if you work in the hospitals and you're just going around and, and you go in a ward to talk to someone and then somebody from uh, even a Muslim or some other religion will say, please don't leave, please come and talk to me too. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, you know, and then, uh, and, and um, it's just because of your energy, you see, and um, I had an opportunity to work in a hospital once, and a, a little kid came in on an emergency thing, and the doctor said, well, I bet you can't fix this one, and I, I just went in and started smiling with him, and, and then he eased up, and he really calmed down, it was just because I was using meta, and they calmed down around me and I was right there with them and everybody calmed down really, really fast. And this is what I tell you about the, uh, the effect it has, uh, the importance of the person in the emergency bay unit. Um, I can't remember, but in our hospital where I was, there's always five and sometimes there's six people in that, in that bay initially if it's a bad accident. But who's the most important person? And somebody said, it's the person that's doing the breathing thing. And I said, no, nah, it's the person who's working with the doctor to figure out what's wrong back and forth, you know, and they're trying to determine, can we give this person a pain medication or not before they go to operate on this person? This is a big deal at this particular point, you're trying to figure out, can you give the person any relief there or not? And the person who has the most control, if the person is conscious, can calm the person down who, when they're conscious, their heart rate will go down and their blood pressure will lower and they relax the strep muscles, let go and stuff. And they start to just, even if there's a tiny belief in that person that's coaching them beside them that I can survive this you're going to try to calm down because if they can calm down they can take them in the OR if they can't move them into the OR they can die right there or they can you know they won't get survival in the OR so all of this is like very touch and go there were some accidents that uh, went happened in the hospital where I was staffing and everybody was involved <laughs> we were involved at admitting people at one time connection person and guarding your voice is breaking your voice is breaking My voice. you kind of froze up too you're frozen no. okay i don't know what to do okay so guarding and protecting is the top toss up and how you see it in your mind in relationship to the practice. One of the things that I tell people when they're examining all of this is remember what the Buddha was. Was he just a farmer walking around? No. And it's not that he was the son of a king that he was walking around. No, he was a meditation teacher. And it's kind of like this, when you read the suttas and isolate them by themselves, you don't get a whole lot. But 
if you read them again, once you know that what he was, was principally this uh, meditation teacher who had done this kind of deep investigation, then you start appreciating it all differently. You start understanding it more deeply. I'm sure by now you've had that experience where you, you didn't really get a, a lot of it in the beginning, but now after a while, when you do it, if you were to pick it up and just read one, you probably would be able to see the Dhamma in it clearly and understand it, but you couldn't do it before. And an interesting part about all this is the inner relationship of different religions and everything. Because if I pick up the King James version of the Bible and read it now, wow, <laughs> in the New Testament, read it. I mean, wow, it's just totally different than I ever did when I was in the study churches. You get so much, so much clearer now. So um, understanding the whole part of it. And also the, I also read the, um, uh, the, the um, Hindu book, uh, the guru, I am that, you read that book. And when you read that book, after you know this practice, and you start reading the guru teaching in that book, it's called I Am That, that's an amazing book. And that's the kind of book Bonte was kidding me when he told me to buy that book. He said, and you, I expect you to read it while you're on the plane because he knew I wasn't gonna sleep. So he said, just, I expect you to read it in three or four hours. This is the kind of book for me where if I read one, of, one or two pieces under one of the numbers, there's tiny subjects the way they did this book and, one or two pages, I can let it go through for a week. And it does things, you start realizing stuff. Why is because it's all very similar, very, very similar, you see. And he's, he's giving the same, a large part of the same message. And everybody was trying to do that in religion in the beginning, but I was talking to someone earlier today and uh, I, we were in a just very brief discussion about um, human beings and groups. And, you know, without the, when, once the family structure starts to disintegrate in a country, human beings have this unbelievable desire to be group, like, Birds of a feather flock together. But then and again, the sound. You can get in a good. Effect. It did. It went. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we can't really we can't really change people and say you can't have a group anymore. It's something that happens automatically when you're growing up. You want to be in a group. So. There's healthy sides and bad sides to everything. <laughs> There's, there's the top and the bottom to everything. There's light and dark on and off, up and down. And all of this is applied to almost everything. Yeah. So that's life. <laughs> you got any more? Anything else? Oh, actually, I understood. Thank you, Sister Kima. I yeah. understood what you uh, said about um, what is guarded and what is protected. Thank Great. you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Hmm? Ah, okay, shall we close then tonight? Okay. Um, let's do this. Okay. May yeah. suffering yeah. ones be yeah. suffering yeah. free yeah. and yeah. the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. May all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. We beings inhabiting faith and earth, Vedas and Nagas of mighty power, share this merit of our May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu.